This gospel text we have, which includes the narrative about Thomas, is unique to the Gospel of John. It's the only place this doubting Thomas appears is in this uh, 20th chapter of John's Gospel. It has two parts to it. It has the part about the forgiveness of sins and Jesus breathing on them. And the second part of the narrative is about Thomas. Now that first part about forgiving sins and so forth became very controversial in the time of the Reformation. And it was dealt with in the Council of Trent in 1545, whereas the reformers said, it doesn't say just the 11 that Jesus breathed on them. It was a community of disciples and therefore it's the community that was empowered to forgive. That was the position of the reformers. But the Council of Trent invoked what was tradition at the time and gave us the right of reconciliation as we presently have it. So the two different parts of this gospel reading don't have a common bridge and therefore I will forego dealing with the issue of Jesus breathing on the community and deal with the narrative about Thomas. You'll notice it was the first day of the week, which means it was the Christian Sabbath. As you know, the followers of Jesus, the first followers were all devout Jews. And therefore, on Saturday, they would celebrate their Sabbath. And when sundown came on Saturday, now they were free to travel, and now they would gather to celebrate the Eucharist on the first day of the week, which was Sunday. And that's how we ended up on Sunday, and the Jewish Sabbath being on Saturday. It was confirmed in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, which was Sunday. So that in turn became a reinforcement of the invitation to celebrate the Eucharist on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. You'll notice in, the, uh, in this structure of this gospel that the disciples rejoice when they saw the wounds of the Lord. Now, the notion of wounds in the Bible is very important and it will come up next Sunday in next Sunday's gospel and we'll deal with that uh, in our text next week. But for now, we deal with the doubting Thomas. I know that's the popular title given to Thomas here, although there is no mention that he doubted. He was unbelieving, and it says, do not be unbelieving, but believe. The Greek word epistos is to be unbelieving, and that's the text that Jews. Don't be unbelieving, but believe, pistos. Be a believing person. Um, and he singled out as the one who hesitated and the one who doubted. And yet, if you read the longer version of this gospel, Mary Magdalene is the first one to encounter the risen Jesus in the gospel of John. And she goes to the disciples and she tells them, I have seen the Lord, but they don't believe her. And now Thomas comes because he wasn't with them and he says, I don't believe. So they were no better than Thomas. They were all unbelieving at the beginning, and then they became believers. In St. Paul's first letter to Corinth, he says, we must walk by faith, not by sight. And to walk by faith is to walk with unanswered questions. To be a believing person is to embrace the questions which are mysterious and unanswered in the journey of life. Pope Francis says, a faith which is not questioning is a faith that needs to be questioned. A faith that does not make us grow is a faith that needs to grow. 
And therefore, we're living in this growing experience of faith. So let me look at that and see how this speaks to us with the questions we have. In my last incarnation, when I was younger, it's a long time ago, um, if you had questions about the church or questions about the faith, it was a sign your faith was weak. But listening to the dogma of today and the insights of the gospel today, when you have questions, it means your faith is strong. It's strong enough to entertain the question. It's strong enough to carry the inquiry. It's strong enough to discuss the mystery, the mystery of life. And therefore, to wonder, to question, is a natural tendency of the one who has a strong faith. The one whose faith is insecure cannot abide the question. So let me see what this means to us. We all have questions sometimes. We all have doubts. We all wonder. I've stopped myself more than once and said, now, Lord, there better be something at the other side because I'm relying on that. <laughs> and say, okay, I do believe. I do believe. Okay, there is something on the other side, so I have something to look forward to. But we all sometimes, at some time, we're going to question things, and we're going to wonder about things, and we're going to encounter mystery where no answer is given to us. So let me look at this. In 1821, Dostoevsky was born in Moscow, an extraordinary fellow. His father was an alcoholic, struggling man. He was a physician, but very dysfunctional. And even though his father was very severe, he will testify later that he had great respect for his father. His father died when he was young. And when he was just 21 years old, he was arrested. He was a revolutionary. And he was sent to Siberia for four years, hard labor. And after that, he was mandated to go into the army for a number of years. And he will testify later that it was his imprisonment that became the time of his enlightenment. He began to read the New Testament. He began to turn to the Lord. He will say that he discovered goodness and power and possibility in those who were despised by community. Those despised by the world became his greatest teachers. And in due time, even though he's a damaged person and he struggles in his life, he's an epileptic, he's addicted to gambling, he will produce out of his struggle out of his questioning, out of his search for deeper meaning in life, some of the greatest novels ever written, Crime and Punishment, The Idiot, The Possessed, and most of all, The Brothers Karamazov. And in this last work, the great novel about the brothers, we are very familiar with the legend of the Grand Inquisitor, that chapter. And in this, he postulates a debate between an agent of the Inquisition and Christ. And the agent proposes that Christ didn't understand the human person. Because the human person is far more comfortable with the certainty of institutional religion than with the anxiety that comes from free and unconditional faith. Now that's worth thinking about. We are more comfortable and more satisfied and feel more secure in the paralyzed security of institutional religion than we are in the power of Jesus Christ, which we inherit through faith. It's an unconditional love, an unconditional statement of God's presence in our lives. 
It's a risk. And we walk by faith, not by sight. I was reading that in the last few days, and it prompted me to go back and take down from my library, Heim Potox. My name is Asher Lev. Heim Potox, an extraordinary fellow. And in this wonderful novel, My Name is Asher Lev, he has um, this man trying to explain the mysteries of life, the, the mysterious injustice of life. And he invokes this old Jewish story, which comes in a rabbinic tradition and is meant to be a commentary on the creation story in the Torah. It's like a Zen koan, and here's how it goes. It's proposed that um, if you had a being that was omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, what's missing from this per being? And what's missing is limitation. There's no limitations. Everything that can be is already achieved. Everything that could happen has already happened. There is no growth. There is no possibilities. There is no vision. There is no room for love. There is no room for forgiveness. There is no room for vision, for dreams. Without limitation, the person is stagnant. The being is empty. There are no possibilities. And therefore, God said, I will make the human person. And I'll make the world with all the limitations, every manner of limitation, in order to give people possibilities in life, to give them dreams and hopes, opportunities to forgive, opportunities to grow, to have visions, opportunities to have dreams, so says the rabbinic tradition. To be imperfect and to walk in faith is the plan of God. And that reminded me about, in the first half of the last century, we had a movement in France, a literary movement, which later became, uh, later was called the theater of the absurd. And it was made up of people like Camus, remember Albert Camus, these were all Nobel Prize winners, Camus, wrote the myth of Sisyphus. Remember the myth of Sisyphus? The guy who rolls the rock up the hill and it keeps coming down and he keeps the futility of this. And uh, Samuel Beckett, this wild Irishman, and he wrote, uh, you know, the waiting for Godot. Remember that? So these two tramps, these fellows, are waiting for Godot. They don't know who Godot is. They don't know what he looks like. They don't know when he's coming. They don't know where they're going to meet him, but they're waiting for him. It's amazing. And they wait, and he doesn't come. And then they come back the next day, and they're good friends, so they change hats, and they argue, and they pray, and they hope, and they dream, and Godot doesn't come. And this was all meant to be a commentary on the futility of life. There is no meaning in life says the theater of the absurd. Life is dreary, it's empty, it's impoverished. There's nothing in life. And therefore, were they depressed? No, they said, that's the meaning, that's the way life is. The emptiness, even um, Samuel Beckett is buried in Paris, and he, he had written uh, in preparation for his death, that he is to be buried in this grave with a headstone. Um, it's going to be limestone, but any color of gray, because that's life is like that. So what happens when we live by faith or we live without faith? 
It's the teaching of the gospel. Someplace in our lives, we encounter mystery. Life isn't perfect. Life can become empty. And the faith by which we are nurtured, the faith which carries us, allows us to dream, to hope, to believe in something greater than ourselves, to believe in a time greater than the moment, to believe that there is wonder, there is miracle. Sometimes the miracle is in our presence and we don't see it. I swear when these little babies come up here for communion on every Sunday and I bless them, I say to the parents, a miracle. And the parents say, yes. The child, a miracle. Every child is a miracle. Every person is a miracle. Unfortunately, when we grow up into our adulthood, we lose the sense of miracle possibilities because we don't have a vision of faith. So listen to the invitation of Jesus in this gospel to say, do not be unbelieving, but believe. Now the world will tell you, seeing is believing. That's not true. The truth of the gospel is, Believing is seeing. If you believe, you will see. You will walk in faith, not by sight.